Hello and welcome. The future of engineering is bright, but in order to be bright, it must also fulfill some preconditions, including talent, skills, uh, and the ability to create the opportunities to uh, service and uh, build on those commitments to, particularly when it comes to large companies overseas. Let's understand it from a slightly different perspective. I'm joined by Bala Bharadwaj, director at the Boeing Research and Technology India, India arm. And uh, let's understand, uh, you know, the, 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 both the demand and the supply, right? So we've been trying to uh, speak to people and say, what is the demand for services like this, uh, particularly in the context of aerospace? And are we geared as a country to meet it from a supply side? Right. See, the uh, aerospace business is quite specialized. And if you look at what is happening in the world today, uh, India is acquiring a lot of uh, new product from overseas providers. Mm -hmm. Boeing is one of them. There are also other companies like Airbus, and mm -hmm. that's so is going to probably sell this MMRC aircraft. And uh, part of that sale India has required uh, that these companies work with Indian companies you know, on what we call as the defense offset mm -hmm. mechanism. Mm -hmm. And that automatically creates some new opportunities because companies like Boeing have to work with Indian companies. There's a certain amount of technology transfer. There's a lot of work created in India for the benefit of the, the companies coming from abroad. It could be in the engineering space, it could be in the manufacturing space, IT, you know, a variety of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one source of the demand that you refer to. The second source of demand is, is indigenous development of product. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier this morning, Dr. Saraswath was uh, listing basically a fairly long, uh, long list of items, uh, which he said adds up to, you know, a large number of crores. Mm -hmm of uh, potential business uh, development of new product basically between now and the next 15, 20 years. So these are both big opportunities. Mm. Uh, so from a demand side, yes, the demand is there. But again, the nature of the aerospace business is that it is not completely predictable. Mm. Uh, there are a lot of things are driven by government policies, decisions made at the government level. So sometimes we think something will happen in 2013. It may not happen till 2014 or 2015. So from that perspective, it's a little harder to pin down. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes people get uh, you know, a little bit discouraged because they think something will happen in the next six months. And there are various delays, either because of Indian government uh, requirements or sometimes foreign government requirements. Right. Uh, so so that creates a little, bit of a little bit of a problem for people if they are planning to a particular timeline. Right. But you weathered this so far. I mean, I th or many companies have weathered this. Well, if you are in the aerospace business, you learn that that is natural. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. you know, when will the monsoon come? You know, it may be on July, June 22nd. It may be on July 2nd. Mm. So you kind of know that it will happen during a certain time frame. So if you want to operate in the aerospace business, you must understand that that is part of that part of the quality or part of the nature of that business. Right. But on the other hand, on the market itself is growing, right? The global market for aerospace and for services from India. Well, you can say yes, because uh, India offers certain talent. Mm. India offers uh, a large number of people that you can hire. For example, if somebody wants to uh, set up a, a center with 200 engineers to be acquired over a period of, say, one month, it is possible to do that in India much more easily than anywhere else in the world. And, and you're talking uh, about skilled, qualified, ready to... Well, skilled, qualified, but then there's always a hierarchy in that. Mm. I mean, you are, if you're going to look for 200 or 500 engineers, all super duper 15 year experience, you're not going to not. find that in India. Mm. But usually the, the work that companies configure, mm. you know, the statement of work, mm is usually such that you have a, a, a certain number of senior people, fewer, you know, people with, say, five years experience, and a larger number of relatively young engineers new to the market. So if you are configuring a project along those lines, then India is a great place. Now, these same people who are joining, let's say, this year, three years from now or five years from now, they will become more experienced. So India has that potential. Mm -hmm. which not many other countries have at this point. 
Right. And, and what are the challenges on the supply side again? I mean, in terms of getting those people, I mean, you said that if you were looking to set up a 100 man uh, research center, you could do it potentially in a, right. in a month. Right. But at the same time, there must be challenges which are also sometimes yes. overwhelming. Yes. Yes. Well, because the 100 people you can get are mostly, you know, okay. raw, yes. inexperienced people. Okay. They may have a degree. Hmm. They may have a degree from a reputable university, but they really don't have understanding of the industry. Hmm. And uh, we don't expect them, at least in Boeing, we don't expect them to come with knowledge of the company. Uh, it's it's uh, unreasonable expectation. Uh, so what the companies have to do is to now train them. So that who, whichever company it is, whichever aerospace company it is, will now have to sit and work with these people, invest in them, train them, and it usually takes, you know, depending on the specific task they are involved in, it could take six months, it could take longer. Uh, so there is a, uh, it is not that they are ready to go and turn the crank right away. They are sufficiently trained, sufficiently educated that they can be trained. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if you invest in them and if the, the work that you are talking about is of some kind of a long term nature, then you, they will be with you. Right. for the next three, five years. Right. How does this fit into the larger story of uh, the future for engineering or future for manufacturing in India, for which there is, of course, a dire need? Well, the, uh, I think the two things come, it come to my mind. One is that the, uh, the engineers who are coming in, they must, not, must be uh, persistent. You know, we talk about if you want to be successful, you must have passion, you must have the ability to be persistent, mm -hmm. and then you must also have what we call people orientation. Mm. So, I mean, this is one way of you know describing what what is what required to be successful. And what they don't have. Perhaps. Well, passion they probably do. Yeah. You know, uh, if so any the industry. Last, the last part, yeah. So the second and the third are hard in India, mm. because the youngsters that are coming in today they want results very very quickly. They were there in the, in the business for 12 months and they say, I want a promotion, I'm getting bored and I'm already an expert on, you know, this or that software. They don't seem to understand that industry doesn't run on one piece of software. Mm -hmm. Just because you are an expert or you figured out how to use one piece of software does not make you any kind of an expert. There are many, many different aspects of that particular industry, whether it's automobile or aerospace, doesn't matter. They all have to come together and that takes time. Mm -hmm. So that is where the persistence comes in. You may be very interested in aerospace, you may be very interested in you know, working in the automobile industry, but unless you have the persistence, the ability to stick around for a few years, you are not going to learn a variety of things about that industry. You know, and, and many of the youngsters get very impatient. They want to move on. They think, well, you know, I'm tired of doing the same thing this, in this company. Let me go somewhere else. And that doesn't build you the engineering skill. Mm -hmm. you know, engineering, you know, unlike you know, some of the other experiences India has had, requires people to make that commitment for the long term. So that is one challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, the second part of it is also the training. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the companies also will have to make an effort to invest in these young people, train them, because training is not free. Mm. You know, it requires somebody in the company uh, to put in the effort. Sometimes it requires us to bring, you know, expertise from somewhere else. Uh, it may require uh, getting an expert from, let's say, United States or Europe mm -hmm. to come here, conduct classes, you know. So it's an investment that you are making. So which is, again, a little bit different from, you know, we already trained you for three months and now you can keep on working. There are many things that have to be learned in the engineering industry that will require more effort from the company. So there's more effort needed from the industry. There's more effort needed from the uh, from the engineers themselves. Okay. And if those two, you know, we are successful in accomplishing that, uh, I think when you look at this, say five years from now, you'll suddenly find that there's there's a much better ecosystem. Right. that will be able to you know, sustain mm. this. So you spoke of a third part, right? You also said the managerial capabilities. Well, that comes in too, because mm. uh, in, in fact, this is what we were discussing in the panel. Mm. Uh, if you want to grow, you not only need the technical skills, but you also need the business skills. Uh, and not everybody wants to get involved with that. Uh, in India, I find many, many youngsters want to have the title of manager. Uh, oftentimes probably not understanding what that means. Mm. You know, it sounds good, you know, you can put it on your card, you can go around showing it to everybody, but not everybody who is a good engineer necessarily enjoys being a good manager. 
I mean, there are, there are slight differences in skills required, training required, but you must also have interest. Mm. Uh, there are, you can be a good engineer uh, doing some very interesting technical things for the next 25 years. Mm. You can also go into management and you can, you can become a good manager, managing people, managing projects and so forth for the next 15, 20 years. So both of them are equally valid paths. Mm. But oftentimes you find that the youngsters in India, somehow they are wired to think that only if they become a manager, they are successful. I think society has something to do with it. We keep expecting people, hey, what did you get a promotion? <laughs> you know, when are you going to become a manager? So you, I find people with cards that say, assistant deputy manager, <laughs> okay? Simply because they want to say manager in the title. Okay, and what's an assistant deputy manager? I have no idea. Mm. But you, you, people create those kinds of uh, unusual titles mm. simply because they want to create the illusion that they are moving ahead. Right. But in reality, you can be a perfectly good engineer, contribute, do excellent technical work for the next 25 years. You don't even have to be a manager any time in your career still have a very successful career. So what point did you switch to be uh, becoming a manager? I, you know, in, I actually got a manager title after working in, in Boeing for 17 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, I was leading projects. So I essentially, I was a project manager. I mean, they used to call me lead engineer. I was a project manager, but I was not officially a manager in our system. Mm -hmm. So we have engineers and we have managers. So I was the manager only after 17 years. Right, so that, that's something. But that doesn't mean that I wasn't doing interesting things or important things before that. Right. You know, and, and that's something that most people in India somehow don't connect with. Right. So, uh, Bala, two points. I mean, you know, uh, for the period that you've been in India and you've set up uh, an R&D center here, uh, what are the two things that have worked well for you and two things that in you would say are, let's say, challenges or uh, have been issues that you've had to confront with? Well, I think, uh, you could answer that our reverse company, order, right? Our company has a great reputation. So people are eager to work with us, yeah. eager to collaborate with us. Uh, so finding people who want to work with us has never been a problem. Right. Uh, in fact, our problem is the other one. You know, the challenge is when so many people come to you saying that they want to work with you, how do you uh, identify those few? Because you know, we cannot do an uh, unlimited number of things in India. Hmm. Uh, what we can do in India is driven by the skills that they bring to the bring to the table. Uh, we don't mind, you know, working with them and helping them to some extent, but we are not here to educate them and bring them up to speed entirely. Mm -hmm. uh, especially, we collaborate with a lot of other companies. If it's somebody we hire in, then of course we will train them as needed. But we don't hire in everybody. We do a lot of work actually uh, with companies. Uh, engineering service companies mm -hmm. as well as universities and mm -hmm. so forth. So when we go to those companies, we expect them to have some basic knowledge that they bring to the table. Uh, so what I find is that there are many companies with very, very similar uh, offerings. Mm. Uh, and again, this is something that I think India tends to do more than other places. Uh, we find uh, replication of the same idea. Mm. You know, if I'm working for some other company, I say, hey, why well, should I work for that guy? I can go set up my own company and I set up a company exactly like the company that I left. Mm. So you will find that there are many companies like TCS and Infosys and so forth. And many times there are people who used to work in those companies. They went off and set up another company. They say, you know, now I have my own company. I have a team of eight people or 18 people or something. And what do you do? I do the same thing that, you know, the other company was doing. So it's one of our challenges is how do we differentiate between these companies so that we can work with you know, the right company. Obviously, we can't work with everybody, but the ones that we want to work with, who do we work with? What is the, you know, how can we set up a mutually beneficial right. uh, relationship? Right. That is one of our challenges. Right, so, and, and last question. And, and that's really a good point because that's also a way of telling companies, uh, whether those who you work with or not, about how they could position themselves. I've actually you. told many of them exactly. that way. I tell them, why should I work with you? Yeah. What is special about you? So sometimes we go back and say, hmm, we, we didn't think about it that way. Uh, you know, next time we'll talk to you. Or they, sometimes they have, you know, they do explain. They have, you know, what they claim to be their differentiator. Right. But uh, on the surface, it doesn't come across that way. There are many, many companies that are very, very similar in nature uh, because we seem to think that, well, this is a tried and tested formula. Let me stick to that. Uh, you know, I made a comment earlier uh, in the panel 
that I think generally Indians are risk averse. Mm. Uh, we would rather do what we are comfortable with than go and do something different because that may fail and there is not only a, a financial implication, there is also a societal implication. None of us wants to be known as, you know that guy, you know, he failed. Mm. Okay, I mean somehow people, you know, whereas uh, uh, in the West, people start companies and if they fail, they say, well, you know, I, you know, not every company we start fails. In fact, majority of them don't work. Mm. Many of them okay. actually end up failing. So there is not a stigma associated with that. Whereas here, I think there is. Still, yeah. So people tend to be very risk averse. So you kind of try to do what worked. You don't try something new and get into right. trouble. So last question. So how are things looking for you? I mean, you know, uh, we started off by saying, you know, the theme is really the future of engineering or engineering manufacturing in India and so on. So broadly, how are things looking to you and for you? Uh, when you say for you, you okay, mean maybe it's more to you. I mean, it's more. How do you see the potential of the larger market? Where where do you see? No, I I think going? India has, especially when you look come to a meeting like NASCOM and you meet various people. Uh, clearly, there are people thinking about you know the, the right questions or the issues. Uh, some of these don't have easy answers, and some of the answers are not something you can you know resolve very quickly. Mm. Uh, and, and part of what is happening, especially in the last maybe a couple of years, is also tied with the dynamics of the global financial situation. Mm. You know, many of these companies are tied into the US and European markets, so if you know, they are having trouble, that kind of reflects here. But I think when I look long term, when I say long term, 5, 10, 15 years kind of thing, certainly there is potential in India. Uh, there are enough motivated people, I think, who will figure it out. I mean, there will be some companies that will fail. Mm. I mean, I think that's a given. Mm. Now, which ones, I don't know. But, you know, there are 50 companies that start out, some won't make it, some will struggle, but there will be maybe, you know, three or five of them that will actually figure out the process, uh, get lucky maybe, and they will succeed. So, I think in the, in the long term, certainly India has a, has a good potential uh, if we don't make some blunders on the way. Right. But I think there are enough smart people who, who understand how these things work. Uh, and, and therefore, these blunders, I don't think, will happen. Right. I think that people are smart enough to come together, collaborate where it's, it's right. appropriate. And, and they're getting some good candid feedback from you. Well, I don't know about me, but uh, you know, there, there, there are many intelligent people here. Yeah, yeah. And, and not only intelligent, but they are also people who have worked in, in other countries. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I just met a professor from Stanford who has been invited. So it's not just bunch of Indians trying to figure it out. These are Indians who have lived abroad, who have you know, that experience. Indians are bringing in experts from other countries, so you are now truly getting a global look into these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think we will fail. Right. Uh, I think there is enough synergy between all these activities. It's the only question is how long will it take? You know, before you can say, yes, success has been achieved. Is it two years? Is it five years? That I don't know. But I think when you, if you look at it long, sufficiently long term, things look. Good. I think things definitely look good. Bala Bhardwaj, thank you very much for okay, speaking with you're us. You're very welcome. Thank you.